I've helped hosts in 54 plus countries, but that's professionally what I do. And then personally, I live in Airbnbs. I'm a permanent long-term guest. And there are certain things that's a headache for me as a long-term guest. So this coronavirus, this has created a great opportunity. A few people have asked me to speak. Well, how, what, what should we do different for long-term guests? And there are, there are things that you should be thinking about that you should be di doing different to attract long-term guests. And I'm going to get into that. The, it's going to be the, the, the speech that I'm going to give is going to be three parts. The first part is specifically, well, what do you do different to appeal to long-term guests? What are long-term guests looking for that short-term guests aren't? What are the differences? The, that's with your specific listing. And the, the second part is going to be how to increase your pool of FPGs. And that, that term I'll use every now and then. That's just future potential guests. And then a couple things, two things specifically that you don't want to do. In times when your calendar is totally open, uh, stress is high. I think people do things without thinking about it. That kind of seems to make sense on the surface. That actually doesn't make sense. And uh, I'll get to those at the very end. So four years ago, I'll start off with something. I wrote a blog post four years ago, and it was predictions about the sharing economy. I republished that post just a few months ago because it seemed to be coming true. One of the four things I discussed is kind of what's happening with coronavirus. As pe and, what ha and it happened to me personally. And, it, and it's something, so I mentioned I'm a long-term traveler, but that's not really who I am. In the beginning of my life, for the majority of my life, I didn't like traveling. I really didn't, it was just okay for me when I traveled. And when I traveled, it would be uh, as a tourist and it would always be with friends. So now for me to s speak to you guys, I'm in Bali right now. I'm, I'm, as I said, I live in Airbnbs. This is an Airbnb. So for me to be speaking and being so pro traveling and living as a long-term guest, it's going to be a transition. I think that a lot of people go through over the next now, but over the next three, six, nine months, where people realize, okay, I can work at home. I don't have to go into an office. That means I don't have to uh, live in this big city where it's very expensive. I don't have to spend an hour getting ready in the morning, putting on clothes just to go to an office. Uh, and actually I'm kind of unproductive there because I have to talk with a bunch of people who I don't really like. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So there'd be a bunch of realizations that I made personally when I started working at home. And then when I started living in Airbnbs where um, I believe the trend will continue up. Um, something that everyone wants, everyone wants to live the best life, right? Everyone wants to live the best life, but um, it could be kind of hard. You can do that in a few ways. You, it, it's kind of hard to live the best life. You can like learn a new language or learn to dance salsa, or you know, learn to be a pilot, or, or maybe you wanna be a stand-up comedian. All these things are quite difficult, but how do you add spice into your life? A really easy way to do that is to travel, is to just go somewhere and live somewhere else where you have to, it's a brand new environment. So now every time you cross the street, it's so new that every time you cross the street, you have to look left and right because you're not really familiar with how the traffic flows and how the people flow and everything. That's so what, so why I'm saying this is because I believe that this trend will continue and will accelerate over the next year as slowly people start figuring it out. And this is true. Families can do this. People with pets can do this. Everyone can do this in our world after the restrictions are lifted with coronavirus. Okay. So, if you believe, if I've made a good case for why long-term travel is around for the long-term, then we're going to start, we're going to want to start to try and put our, put our mindset, change or shift our mindset into how do we attract these guests? Uh, if they're coming for long-term, they're probably going to, going to be cooking. They're probably going to use the kitchen. That makes the kitchen a lot more important. They're probably going to be working from your space. That means a desk or a, an office, ideally, but a desk at the very least becomes more important. There are some downsides though. 
Okay, so now moving into the section, how do you appeal, or what's the difference? What's the difference between short-term and long-term guests? So there is a downside. The downside that no one, nobody thinks about is there's more wear and tear in your house because the guest is not coming as a tourist to be outside most of the day. They're actually living in your house as a long-term guest would. There's no difference between a 12-month lease and a, and a one-month. The person's going to be in your house a lot longer. That means there's going to be more wear and tear and there's going to be more expensive utilities, electricity, gas, garbage, Wi-Fi usage. My host right now in Bali, he said electricity costs him usually uh, one, one million uh, rupiah. That's about a hundred bucks. This month it's cost him two. And I was surprised because I told him I've actually been very uh, conscious about my usage. I don't even, the AC is on right now, but I'm like, I haven't even used AC when I sleep or anything. And, and it occurred to us, probably it's because I'm just simply spending more time in the house. <clears throat> Give me a second to grab, grab my water over here. It's out of reach. Okay. The other downside is if you choose a bad guest, well, you have a bad guest for three weeks or three months. I won't go into how you can, how you can filter out bad guests, but I have a blog post and a video on this. You can, they say very similar things. Uh, but it's a very easy process. It really comes down to the guest profile and the guest message, the content of the message. I've used this strategy and I've had one, one issue in the past three years. Um, and it was in New York at a listing where I get a lot of really bad guests for some reason. So maybe I'll send Sebastian a link to that afterwards and you can put it in the show notes if people are interested because I have quite a few videos and blog posts at this point. So the upside, there's a lot of upsides. The, one of the upside is if you choose a good guest, you have one guest check-in and one guest for that three weeks, that three months, one cleaning, depending on if you're giving them uh, cleanings mid-stay. Uh, keep in mind things, this is an important point. This is, this is the overall point. Things that are annoyances to short-term guests, guests who are going for three, four days, become issues and complaints for long-term guests. In other words, things that a short-term guest won't even tell you about, they're just ignore. And I'll give you a few examples, become complaints. You're gonna hear about them from the long-term guest. So in a prior Airbnb, there was a construction noise. Well, if you're just there for, for two, three, four nights, construction, and you're not there to work or anything, construction noise during the day might not be a big deal, but if you're there for the long term and you're working and it's construction noise for the next three months you're staying here, that becomes a big deal. Or if you have one of those showers where it's really hard to get warm water, it seems to be either really hot or frigid, that becomes an issue. When I was in Ubud, there is at the evening time, you're in the jungle, so there's lots of flies. There was little tiny cracks in the door in a, in a house in Ubud, Bali. And what ha the result of this was at the nighttime, flies could get in this door. So while I was, I actually booked an Airbnb with an indoor living room. Uh, but when I got there, these little holes, basically it was outdoors because in the evening time, all the flies would come in and, and there'd be flies buzzing around your head. If I'm there for just two, three, four nights, that's an annoyance for sure, uh, but it's not a big deal. But if I'm there for three months, this becomes an issue. And it's a quite large issue because all the doors have these small little um, crevices in them. I think I saw a chat. Am I able to open this and see? Let me see when you say desk or workspace disconnection. Ah, so Jean says, when, when I was talking about a desk or a workspace, does it actually have to be a desk or can it be a dining table? Um, it can be a dining table at the bare minimum. It should, there should be a surface wide enough for a desk, whether it's a dining table or not. However, 
people who work from home, um, they quickly realize that they prefer a desk. It's the same reason why folks don't recommend, uh, don't recommend you read on your bed or do other things on your bed because the bed should just be associated with sleep. And it's true, if you ever try and read on your bed, at least me, you get tired, you get very tired very quickly. So there should, and I, I noticed that I work, I'm, I'm actually, <laughs> I'm using a desk that I purchased because desks are so uncommon and I've realized how much more productive I am with a desk. I purchased, uh, I purchased a desk for my host because there wasn't one here and I know I'd be here the long term. It's in my bedroom. Um, which isn't ideal, but at the very least, it's a separate space. So I recommend getting getting a desk. Uh, it, it's not, if at all, if you can fit it, if you're talking a studio or a very small space, um, but also keep in mind your guest, if they're there to work for the, to work, probably, you probably need, yeah, my recommendation is a desk is definitely ideal. At the bare minimum, a space, and that's not true. That's not a default. Maybe for, maybe for everyone listening here, you all have it as your good hosts, but I filter out as a guest. Many, I filter out as a guest many Airbnbs because they don't even have a space to work on. Maybe the dining table is actually uh, a stool on a, you know, those thin countertops. Uh, so that's, uh, so a chair is also important. Uh, a, a proper desk chair is ideal. I'm sitting in some outdoor furniture. But that's a good question. Um, there's a few things you can do to your listing to automatically increase the, the, your FPGs by a lot. A desk is one of them. As someone who travels long term, it's very, very, very rare to find uh, a desk, a separate desk. Usually there's a kitchen table or something, but very rare to find a, a, a desk. And when I do, I usually book it. So a few more, I want to go through each room and kind of get, get everyone to think about, well, what are some, what are some annoyances to short-term guests that maybe they're not telling me about that long-term guests might tell me about. So the, the living room, the TV becomes important. There's a lot of places that don't even don't have a smart TV. Every place should have a smart TV where you can connect to YouTube or Netflix uh, people staying at home longer, that becomes a big issue. And TVs, if you buy a high quality one, they're good for five, six, seven years. They're good for a long time. I think I mentioned the bathroom. It, sometimes the water heater is small. That if, you're, if your place allows more than two people or more than two bathrooms, uh, it's quite common in Airbnbs where only one person can take a shower at a time because of the hot water. That's, that's an annoyance which becomes more of a bigger issue as, a, as you're a longer term guest. The kitchen is often neglected. It does look at your cookware. If it looks like it's been in a fight, the handle is loose. There's so many scratches that it looks like a health concern. This is also quite common for me as a long-term guest. They might have a kitchen, they might have some pots and pans, but rarely is it a full, full amenities and rarely are those amenities um, a pleasure to cook with. These are things you should be replacing depending on your guest and how often they're using them, all of these things should be replaced um, with some, some kind of frequency, with some kind of timeline. A bedroom, uh, blackout curtains, where if, again, annoyance, if you, if, you're, uh, if you wake up to light, I'm a, I'm a sensitive sleeper, light comes in, I wake up. Uh, just an annoyance if I'm on vacation, but if I'm here long-term, that becomes a big issue. Blackout curtains is a huge plus. Think of Las Vegas when people go to sleep at all, all hours of the night. They have the best blackout curtains. You can't tell the difference between 3 p.m. and 3 a.m. Mm. Another often uh, neglected aspect is uh, some people sleep on their back, some people sleep on their side, and some people sleep on their stomach. Uh, so you should provide one soft pillow for, for back sleepers and, and stomach sleepers and one firm pillow for slight side sleepers. One firm and one soft pillow. That's something super easy that no one does. I think there's a pillow on Amazon. It's called maybe the perfect pillow or the pancake pillow. And it allows you to, it's one pillow, but it has uh, a few pillows inside, slim pillows, and you can pull out some 
so the guests can make it customizable to however they like. Sarah is asking, what's a good title for your listing to attract long-term guests? The title actually doesn't change. So my, my strategy for the title doesn't change. Avoid, I have a whole article on this. I, and actually I made a tool. Actually, maybe I'll just link the tool here for, for people to check out. Let me see. The title should be, you're, you're keeping, you're selling. So the title should be what is going to attract the guest. What's going to attract the guest is the amenities. What amenities do you provide? Don't tell them how many bedrooms or bathrooms you have. Don't tell them what neighborhood you're in. Um, they either already know or they don't know the neighborhoods. Uh, tell them, tell them that you can tell them the distance from certain landmarks, very popular landmarks. If you have any kind of amenity that sets you apart from the competition, a pool, a hot tub, parking, I think in, in uh, Miami, parking is probably a big one. Anything that sets you apart from the competition, that's a good idea. If you have a basic listing though, then, then you should still do amenities, but it's probably not going to be like a rooftop pool. It might be smart TV. It might be a, a self check-in. It might be things like this. Um, yeah, I give examples of, of bad titles here in this tool. So I won't go, I won't go through it, but use that tool on the very bottom. You'll see an actual tool with some questions that I ask you. And one thing that I like is if you're, I like to stay in walkable areas as a, as a guest. So how do you communicate that? walkscore.com. It gives you a walk score zero to a hundred in a lot of places in Miami walk score is going to be very high, but that communicates to guests, uh, walk score 99 that communicates. Oh, okay. Well, walk score 99 probably means I can walk at the very least. It might get someone's attention. It gets attention. Well, what does walk score mean? I've never seen that. They'll click on your listing and they'll see this beautifully optimized listing briefly explaining walk score, you know, uh, within 10 minutes walking, you can get to cafes, parks, the gym, grocery store. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. Can you just write it down for us? Like the, how do you say it? Walk score, like walking score.com. Yeah. Walk score, walk score.com. Okay. I'll add that in here too. And it gives, actually, it gives a walk score, it gives a transit score, and it gives a biking score. So for Miami as well, biking might be, might be quite important. Um, if your guests rent a lot of cars, you know, driving score or, or transit, transit might be important. But I'll usually highlight these if they're above 80. And then I'll, in parentheses, I'll briefly describe what it means in the listing. Though I might just say transit score 100 in the title. And I will say uh, emojis, Airbnb specifically says emojis are not allowed on Airbnb. At the bottom of that title tool, I have a little box that kind of explain, I have a link to the Airbnb content policy where it says emojis are not allowed. Um, so you have to decide if you want to disobey that or not. Uh, for me, I think about it, well, how much benefit does it bring me? And what's my risk of, of any negative action from Airbnb? I think emojis are quite important. Um, so I do use them. But they're not gonna, they're not gonna make, emojis are not gonna make you successful. They're just one tool in your toolkit. Uh, there's th this idea of spaces I've come up with. Um, here in Bali where there's just, there's a, there's only one indoor space. Usually the bedroom is indoor and then everything else is outdoor. And during the daytime, it's so hot that usually you're indoor. So usually you're relegated to your, your bedroom, but the houses that do it the best, they increase the amount of spaces they have. 
and a space I don't define as a room. It's just a, a separate area where you can hang out at. So in my room here, there's four spaces. There's the, there's the bed area, there's the desk. Right next to me, I have an armchair, which is quite uncommon. And then I have a bathroom. Um, outside, there's a hammock. That's a space. Um, this place doesn't have a balcony, but if you had a balcony, you should have furniture. That's a space. It's common here in Bali to have a kind of a cabana next to the pool. That's a different space. Any separate, separately identifiable space that you can hang out in, it makes the space, it makes the, the Airbnb listing feel a lot bigger. It, 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 it makes it more comfortable. My favorite Airbnb here had the most spaces, the most different spaces you could, you could hang out at. It felt much bigger than it actually was. If people are traveling long-term, they're more likely to bring their pets or their children. So again, keep in mind, I'm trying to shift your mindset. Just think about it from your guest perspective. Well, might they, might they bring pets? The answer is yes. Well, the answer is not yes, but the statistic is enough people travel with their pets and there are so few listings. If there's 10% of people travel with their guests, there, in any given city, I just wrote a blog post on this, there's about 5% of listings that are pet friendly. So that means 10% of traveling guests are trying to squeeze themselves into 5% of listings. One of the best things you can do to, to greatly expand your pool of guests is to make your space pet friendly. While I've been here in Bali, I actually adopted two dogs in a pet friendly space to see it from the guest perspective. And I'm going to write a blog post about, um, they, they told me the space was pet friendly and though they accepted pets, it wasn't ideal. There was things that the dog could get into and also pet friendly. It differs puppy pet friendly or mature dog pet friendly. Uh, if you go that route, it's really the single best thing you could do to attract a lot of guests, to boost your occupancy and nightly rate. But there are things you should do to your house to make it pet friendly, to avoid damage. Family friendly, child friendly, super important. There, I had a neighbor here and they were moving from their house. Um, and in, in Bali, there's, no, there's not many tourists coming. So if you have a guest, you really want to appease them. This was a family mom and a dad and one child, they were moving houses because of one, one reason. And that was the stones that this, that this house, that this Airbnb used to get in from the gate to the front door. When it rained, these stones got slippery. And as they were my neighbor, it was the same host. I had the same stone, stones and I noticed that too. For me though, it's not a big deal. My feet are big enough where if I slip, it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to catch. But thinking of it from her perspective, yeah, that, that small risk of her child slipping on the stone and cracking their head open, even if there's a small risk of that happening, that's enough to, for them to move out of this house. For, for the, the host just lost two, three, four months of rent because of this one non-child proof thing. That brings up a good point always uh, communicate with your guest and let them know that any feedback is highly appreciated, whether that's cleaning feedback, anything, any feedback is highly appreciated because you want them telling you about this. My guess is unless they were asked, they're not going to offer up this advice. Hey, we're leaving because these stones aren't, um, they're slippery. If they said that a smart host might change the, change the, um, change the stones right away, especially in depending on how much it costs, which these were just lift up, you know, you lift up the stones. So fostering great communication with your guests could mean you save two, three months of rent. I got a couple chats here. Patty's confirming emojis have brought more attention to my site. That's true. Think about it from the guest perspective. If you haven't traveled as a guest, go travel as a guest scope out your competition or do a weekend trip. But as you're looking at these listings, Airbnb makes them very similar looking. Your title uh, blends in with everyone else unless you have a, a yellow star in there. It's a pattern interrupt while you're, while you're scanning down these listings. Anything that gets you a little bit more attention 
is a is a good thing and could be a really good thing depending on your competition. Rodman says, if anyone needs a housekeeper, oh, okay. Yeah, you could disregard that. Housekeepers, uh, housekeepers are important though. Um, I, you have to, yeah, okay, I'll disregard that. <laughs> Sarah okay. says, people with pets are usually very respectful and clean. Uh, should we be leaving any food gifts? Do you like that a guest? I don't understand the last part you said, uh, but it's funny that you say this. So I ran a poll and I said, um, because so few people are not pet friendly. I said, are you not, why are you not pet friendly? And I, and the answer was many hosts were not pet friendly because of the pet. They weren't pet friendly because of the host. They were worried about the human taking care of the pet rather than the pet itself. <laughs> but I think, I think you're right. Reviews come into play a big time when people are traveling with pets. But there's also the allergy thing. If, if anyone in your family uses your house and has an um, allergy, you wouldn't want to accept the pet, depending on how severe the allergy is. Should we be leaving any food gifts? So food gifts, I'm guessing, for the pet. These are all, these are all good long-term strategies. They're not going to affect you in the short term. You're not going to get boosted up. But this, this is what I call a surprise and delight feature. It's something that the guest isn't going to book your space for, but as they arrive at your space and they find these surprise and delights, a, a food, a food treats for their dog, that's going to give them a good experience at your place. And that's going to probably give you a, a good review on your listing. And that'll be, that shows up over weeks or months, good reviews. How do you get guests with pets to pick up after their pets? That's, uh, <laughs> that's, the, that's the human issue I'm talking about. Um, you have to rely on, well, if that's the only, you're, you're talking about in your yard, if that's the only thing that they're doing, uh, it's not ideal, but it's not the worst thing in the world. You could, uh, there's numerous things you could do. You could provide, you could provide uh, baggies right at the front door. Maybe you can hook them on the front door. Um, and there's when through my automated messages, I, I highlight usually one important house rule. If I have it three days before check-in, I have a digital guidebook. I have the house rules on Airbnb. I have house rules in the digital guidebook, but guests don't read. So if there's something that comes up over and over and over again, well, I'll actually add that into the automated message I send four days before check-in. And if this, if you get a lot of pets and this is a really big issue, then this would be something big issue, meaning more than 50% of guests seem to not be picking up in your yard for whatever reason, then you might want to add it in either as a message 24 out, you know, 24 hours after check-in, I'll send a message that says, Hey, how, how was your first night? You checked in. Okay. If you need anything, I'm always here. Feedback's greatly appreciated. And then you could say, um, PS, uh, you could come up with some kind of a, a reason or whatever. Be sure to pick up after your dog. We've left uh, extra bags for you to pick up. Our grass is very sensitive. Um, if you know, please pick up, uh, poop. So we don't have brown spots you could get creative. As a long-term traveler, things, more things become important to guests or different things become important to guests. Well, I already mentioned uh, a desk. I don't know if I mentioned Wi-Fi. Fast Wi-Fi is going to be very important. And purchasing from a, a reliable Wi-Fi company. There's a lot of folks uh, here in Bali, they, they advertise a 20, even 50 megabytes per second Wi-Fi but there's two Wi-Fi providers, internet providers. One is the low, the budget. They have a lot of outages and it's really not 20 or 50, it's much less. And the other one is high quality. Uh, to a short-term guest, probably just an annoyance. Um, to a long-term guest, a big issue. Wi-Fi is, everyone knows it's super important. I'm not sure why guests uh, host skimp on this, but most definitely go for the fastest Wi-Fi with the best provider. That's a long-term strategy that will show up in your reviews that will keep you going and keep you successful over the long-term. 
So some things that become very important to longer term travelers and longer term travelers, really it's seven days. That's what, that's what I consider a long term traveler, but probably it's a month up to three, six months. Washer and dryer, either in the unit or nearby. If you can, in your guidebook, you should be adding in where's the best washer and dryer. Or if you have a washer and dryer, that can be, that can be highlighted a bit more. Things like getting your guests acclimated. Where's the, where's the best or the nearest grocery store? Here at this Airbnb, there's a, there's a cafe and a grocery store just if I walk to the road. That's super convenient. As a long-term guest, I'm missing some butter or some milk or something. That's super convenient. That, should be, that can be highlighted now. Whereas if you're just here for two or three days, short-term guests, it's not a huge bonus because you're more likely to get up and go explore. So things around you, not as important. If you're family friendly, playgrounds, playgrounds are important. If you're in a building, uh, people, hosts love to highlight the building amenities, the gym, the pool table, the office space, uh, the playground, the, the barber on site. I was just optimizing a listing and the building had a whole community, a grocery store. Um, this becomes important for long-term guests. That's a huge bo a bonus convenience item to have all these things within your complex or within walking distance. Whereas as a short-term guest, you're probably not getting a haircut when you're there for just three or four nights. I keep saying three or four nights, average reservation on Airbnb, 3.5 nights. A little bit market dependent, but on average, I think probably Miami, it's three and a half nights as well. If you're nearby, depending on how long the guest is gonna be there, are you near doctors and dentists? And by the way, I want to just make a quick plug. I've got a free course on my YouTube. It's, uh, I think it's at 36 videos. Try and keep it to five minutes or less videos. A lot of the things I'm talking on here, I cover in individual videos a little more uh, in depth. And then if you find yourself interested, or this is a point you can really improve on, I usually have a blog post that's uh, even more in depth and longer. That's on, on my YouTube. Uh, everything is optimized, my BNB. It's, I think it's the third playlist, so scroll down and you'll see it. All right, the third section is um, ways to increase your FPGs, and then I'll end with the two things that you should not do. So we already talked about pet friendly. You should be pet friendly, if at all possible. Event space. Uh, leverage, leverage event space. Uh, there's, a, there's a website called Splacer and Peerspace. There's a few others. But if you can get a few uh, events, people, they're, usually it's students or people shooting commercials or, or small budget films. If you have a really beautiful space, this is definitely an option for you. It can also be off sites for team meetings. This is going to become a lot more prevalent if companies actually do away with their office space or do away with a big office space. There might be some overflow of team meetings when they want to come together. My glasses, is there a glare? No. How about? Oh, I heard my YouTube channel. That was me, I'm, I'm putting the link. Thank That's you. me. <laughs> um, even, though, even though we're talking about long-term rentals, you should, uh, I recommend lowering your minimum nights uh, to one night. Mm -hmm. If you can, vet the guests, good guests, then one night stays are okay and they can fill in a lot of gaps in your listing. Um, it, the, the, the more two night minimum stay, three night, every night you go up in minimum stay, you're a huge pool of FPGs is not no longer seeing your listing. And even though long-term reservations are the norm right now, there's still a whole ton of short-term reservations going on. Ah, this is one of my favorites. Super easy, automated message. Uh, after checkout, there's, there's uh, three messages I sent. These are automated messages. After checkout, four hours after checkout, I send a message and it says, um, it says no matter what, unless they were really bad guests, it says, you know, thanks for staying. I'm happy you're here. I, again, reiterate feedback is much appreciated. But then I say, thanks for keeping the place in such good shape. Uh, I'll leave a five-star review for you tomorrow when Airbnb allows. So I'm telling them 
if you're a long-term guest, um, this happens to me all the time, issues come up with the host and you're, and depending on how the host is with communication, I'm thinking, well, are, are they mad at me? Are they going to leave me a bad review? Should I not leave them a review? Should I leave them a less good review? Should I leave them a negative review? Do I, do I, if I want to be spiteful, should I leave them a negative review? There's a lot of times where I just don't know. Does the guest, does the host not like me? Um, but now how to do away with that, send them a message, tell them, Hey, you're getting a five-star review for me. You left my place in good shape. Uh, and that helps them. That makes them one that makes them feel bad. If they were going to leave a negative review, that makes them feel bad. <laughs> and, uh, number two, it increases the percent of reviews on Airbnb average reviewed reservation, 70%, 70% of guests review your space. For me, I'm up at 90%. And I, I give that extra 20% bonus specifically to this message and the next two. And if you review it at a higher rate, well, that means negative reviews affect you less. Now, the second message I send is um, I'll send them a, uh, a family and friends discount. I'll say uh, 24 hours after they check out, I'll say, hey, you were such a good guest. If you have family or friends coming to town, and then I offer a discount. Uh, I forget what mine is. I think it's 10, if I'll give you 10% off or I'll give you an extra fr an, a free night if you stay three nights or four nights, whatever. And this actually gets me a few bonus reservations every year. And it makes the guests feel good because uh, they feel like, oh, they have a connection now in, in Miami. Any friend that I have, any family or friend that I have, I can say, hey, I had a good experience. Here, stay here. And now you're the cool friend that's giving them a little bit of a bonus discount. And you know that it's a good place to stay anyways. And it also acts as a review reminder. And then um, sometimes, depending on the listing, sometimes I'll send a review reminder uh, 48 hours after checkout. I'll just let them know, hey, um, as this is a, you know, an online thing, my online reputation is, is hugely important. Uh, I left you a re review to help you get reservations as a guest. Uh, it would mean a lot if you were to leave me a review. Calendar availability. Right now, folks are booking very short term. The, the, the lead time between a reservation and a check-in is much shorter. In the future, I think that will change. So increasing your, increasing your calendar availability. If you're at three months, make it six months or nine months. Uh, I think that's, that's sufficient, nine months out. Re-optimize your listing. When you go through, Airbnb is about momentum. It seems I'm either getting reservations or I'm not getting reservations. If you're not getting reservations, you need to kickstart Airbnb. And one of the ways to do that is to re-optimize your online listing, switch around the photos, change up your title, uh, look at your text and see if you can uh, re-optimize it. Go into your back end. Everyone should go in after this call, go into your back end. Airbnb just added a new section and it's, um, it's about safety. You know, do you have a pool that is it gated? Um, are you near a playground? Do you have uh, rails on your hand, hand, um, handrails on your stairs? A bunch of these things, you can click it off in 30 seconds. And I believe it's a ranking factor. Airbnb asks for four safety items on your listing. I think it's um, a first aid kit, uh, fire extinguisher, and two more, carbon monoxide detector and, and fire, um, fire alarm. Even though Airbnb has never said this, I think that if you mark all those four off, it gives you a ranking boost because it lowers Airbnb's liability. If you have more safety items, it lowers their liability as a company. Ah, I'm just reading my notes here. Um, so be creative. If you, if you live in, um, if I, I was, I was living in San Francisco. I have a few Airbnbs in San Francisco. I know there's a whole bunch of startups who have people coming in and have offsites. Well, I reached out to a few and I said, Hey, my Airbnb, um, it's just three blocks from your space. If you need, if you have a visiting guest or you need an offsite, uh, here's my link, reach out. I'll give you guys a discount. Now, 
two things that you should not do. Uh, the first one is list on multiple platforms. There's, there's an asterisk there. Uh, this may or may not be a good idea, but it's not a good idea to just simply put your listing on seven uh, short-term rental platforms. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense because whenever people do this and they reach out to me to optimize their listing, um, especially if it's one of my, the premium package I have, I ask them what percentage comes from Airbnb and then what's the second highest. And in 90% of the cases, Airbnb makes up 70, 80%. And then a second one makes up like 10, 15%. And then the other ones make up a few reservations every year. If you were to delist, if this is your situation where Airbnb makes up even 70% of your reservations, if you were to delist from all the other ones, well, at least a portion of that 30% booked on other platforms would be booked on Airbnb because now that now there's calendar availability for that 30%. Now it, it might be 10% or it might be 20% booked on Airbnb if you were just on Airbnb. But as a host with just one, two, three listings, it doesn't make sense for me and it's not really feasible for me to have a really nice manicured listing on five, six, seven different platforms. So the benefit really isn't there. There's just a little, there's extra work for no real benefit. I rather focus on one or two platforms, be an expert and be, at, be, be the best on those platforms. The, there's an exception here. If you wanna list on one more platform, if your space, uh, there's a lot of corporate rentals if your space is known for something, uh, then it might make sense to list on one other niche platform. If it's uh, traveling nurses, if you're near a hospital, and there's, uh, I think there's even a website for traveling nurses, that might make sense to have that as your second platform. Or if you're family, family, uh, family destination vacation, uh, there's probably a there's probably a niche website for that. Or visiting professors, if you're near a university, visiting professors, that might be an option. Military personnel, if you're near a base, that could be an option. Um, or in, in some cases, there is like booking.com makes up uh, a huge portion. In some cases, it makes sense to list on two of these really popular platforms. The second thing that you shouldn't do is build a direct booking website. The reason why this doesn't make sense is because it's, it requires a lot of work for not much benefit. If you just have one listing and you're in South Beach, Miami, vacation rental South Beach, Miami, you're not going to come up high unless your website is very old and you have a lot of content on there and a lot of people are linking to your website. And it most of the time doesn't make sense to create your own website uh, because of the upkeep and you should be writing blog posts. People might, a great way, if you have a website, somebody might not search uh, South Beach Miami vacation rentals, but they might search to do's activities, family activities, South Beach. Uh, and if you have a blog post written about that, that blog post, because it's more specific, more likely to rank. And if someone is searching that blog post, they're probably gonna come there and then they can get to your website that way and then realize, oh, this, is a, this has a house and I can book it. I can book this place. <clears throat> if anyone has a direct booking website um, and it does work well for you, let me know in the comments. The last thing I wanted to speak about is pricing. Um, pricing for long-term rentals, it's quite different. And I myself haven't even really figured it out yet. Because if you're in Miami, you have a lot of events, a lot of conferences coming to town. But if you're a long-term rental and you're booking for a few weeks to a few months at a time, event pricing goes out the window because the guest isn't booking for that date. They're booking for three months. That event, I think there's Art Basel. That probably brings in a bunch of people. Uh, but if someone's there during that event, but they're there for three months, that goes totally out of the, out of the window. So um, 
I'm one, I'm, I don't even think smart pricing is really needed on long-term reservation if that's really exclusively what you do. If you get some long-term and some short-term, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, but even if you get an extra 300 bucks a night for Art Basel over a three month period, that's like an extra 10 bucks a night. You wouldn't even notice that. So that's something I'm trying to uh, figure out on my own end. Any, any advice from the community, much appreciated. And it looks like we've got some chats here. So let me read these. It's... Cable TV, important to long-term guests. I, the only thing that I think of when I think of cable TV is sports. Everything else pretty much can be, I think, gotten on the, on the web. If, uh, if that's important to your guests, then it would make sense. My guess is in general, it's probably not super important, but it's, it's, it's market and guest specific. I think you can even probably stream uh, sports games online somewhere. So maybe that's something you look into if you don't want to have cable TV, but smart TV, almost yes, everyone. How important is it for hosts to stay in our property? Uh, this is something I recommend you do on an annual basis or twice a year if possible, or have some good friends stay there. Say, hey, go stay for the weekend for free. Just give me any feedback that you notice. The reason why is because you're gonna notice things when you're staying at your place, you should also use the shower, use the kitchen, use the TV, use everything because you're going to notice things that the cleaner is not going to notice. If your shower, if your shower drain is clogged and it's it kind of water is pooling on the ground, the cleaner is not going to notice that. If the, the light bulbs are out, the cleaner is not going to probably notice that. Um, and it'll also give you ways to improve. I like the idea of having a friend check in or someone unfamiliar with your place specifically for check-in. Check-in is a, a huge area uh, of improvement for a lot of hosts, making it super easy, but not, not too complex. It depends if you're just a private single family residence home, it's not an issue. This becomes more of an issue if you're in a rural area or if you're in a big building that requires some extra instruction to reach your front door. Christine says, I own a long-term traditional rental, not furnished, where I typically do a year lease to include background checks, credit checks, and collect a deposit. With Airbnb, how do you handle any rentals over 28 days or if someone is interested in month to month? On Airbnb, if you book for any more than one month, Airbnb will pay you in advance, but only that first month. So if they book for three months, you'll get the first month payment. And then day one of month two, you'll get the second month payment. Um, Air, that's something you are allowed to do this, by the way, you are allowed to ask for additional information from the guest and do your own uh, background checks. Um, I don't do this. I rely predominantly on the Airbnb guest profile reviews. If, um, if the, if the profile is brand new, by the way, this is a big red flag. So if the profile is brand new uh, and someone's requesting for three months, I probably wouldn't do it. I might accept them for one month and see how it goes, but you can tell a lot based on prior reviews and how the actual guest profile looks, the date that profile was made. How did the guest fill in that profile? Depending on, it tells you a lot about the guest if they have not filled out their profile at all, or if they've went a step further to verify themselves, to add a little text to tell you who they are, this communicates to you that their intention is positive. Their intention is to use Airbnb for the long term. If someone's just coming on with, with no verification, a bad photo, no text, uh, you know, just email verified and phone verified, well, it gives you pause. Okay, well, why are they on here? They didn't take any time to fill this out, what are their what are their real intentions? But I don't know. I don't think Airbnb collects all three months in in advance. I have to I have to check on that. I think they actually might, to be honest. At which point, monetarily, you're not really on the line at all because Airbnb already has the money. 
How many homes do I have? I have a, a website called uh, Balo. That's my property management company. I started uh, this game. I wanted to build, uh, I'm, no, not that. Balo, uh, Balo like, uh, so Balo stands for, um, it's the first two letters of Airbnb's slogan, belong anywhere, B-E-L-O. Balo is also the name of Airbnb's uh, symbol. So uh, yeah, Balo.com. So that's the property management company. I, this is a part-time thing for me. At any one time, I'll manage no more than five listings. Uh, and I do that. Uh, I test out some marketing strategies, whatnot on these listings. I also like to stay as a host. Um, and right now, because of coronavirus, uh, I lost three listings. Uh, one of them was uh, because they went for long-term rentals. The other one was because uh, they were gonna move to a new, a new space. My prediction is coming true. They didn't need to live in this area anymore. They wanted to live somewhere else. So they decided to go live somewhere else. And the third one was they were gonna work at home. Uh, so I think that's great. Um, I posted on my Instagram about, uh, I actually have space for one listing. So if anyone here um, is interested in a property manager, right now I'm looking for one Airbnb listing. I have four, uh, that's how many I have. They're in, uh, where are they at? I think they're in Arizona, California, and New York. Yes. Please send me the recording. Yeah, I think this will be recorded. Sebastian, are you gonna post yeah. this somewhere? Yeah, we're recording it right now and um, we'll prepare it and uh, send it to them. Although it should take us a few days, but we'll have it recorded for you, Megan, and Thank anyone you. else who needs to. The restaurants are closing at nine o'clock and I, I have to eat. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You, you wow, it's so, it's so bright out still. Yeah, That's it's cool. 8.05. Oh yeah, that's cool. I like, I went to, um, the first place I went to was uh, Tallinn, Estonia, and it was light until midnight. It was, I'd never seen anything like it. It was so cool. That's, yeah. yeah I liked it. And then when you go, it's like that too. Sometimes. It goes up to 9.30. Yeah, that's cool. Monica's asking, do you recommend to sign a rental agreement with a long-term guest? Um, I wouldn't say I recommend that. I know some people do that and that's okay. Uh, it, it protects you for sure. Um, you need to tell the guest, you need to show this to the guest before they book. That's a rule on Airbnb. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I neither recommend it nor don't recommend it. I don't do it. Um, and also they don't have to physically sign anything. If you add that rental agreement to the house rules, um, by the the guest has to click off. They've read it, so that's their electronic signature. We, there might recently, be some... we recently what? just started doing it because we we got a neighbor harassing us and saying that complaining about Airbnb. But yeah, we've been doing it for three years, and apparently the area that we're doing Airbnb is illegal now for short terms. So now we have to sign lease for monthly, but we kind of cancel them throughout the after three four days. But we do monthly lease. We rent out the three, four days just in case an expector or something comes in and, you know, so now we've been doing monthly lease because that's what's required. And okay. I haven't posted on my Airbnb thing because I don't want them to see it. You know what I mean? The inspector, whoever is trying to mess with our listing, it's obviously just, I think is is mostly jealous people or, but yeah, there's like 26 people doing it in the area. There's 26 Airbnb the left street and the right street down to the water in the radius of 0.3 miles, like 26 people are doing it. But yeah, we can't do it. The city of Miami is not allowing short terms. But and we that's defined as... <clears throat> so now we have monthly Anything? leads and we're doing it through monthly leads. But you're listed on Airbnb with a 30 day minimum? Yeah, now I had to do it like that now. But usually we do like three, four days minimum. But now I have okay. to do three, 30 days and that, you know, I'm just, so now I have to gauge my pricing and I have to change it all. And, you know, it's, it's very crazy. I think they're just trying to stop us for. 
Yeah, that's a, so that's, that's a short term um, pain in the ass. Yeah. I think <laughs> it's unfortunate where cities, cities that San Francisco is the best example, New York as well. It sounds like Miami cities that are so popular that have so many people wanting, wanting to go there, short term guests, guests wanting to visit their space which is the envy of many cities around the world. They would love to be so popular and get so much revenue from tourists. The cities that have this great problem seem to be fighting it, seem to be fighting it. And if my prediction comes true, well, all these cities are gonna make a 180. If my prediction comes true, where a lot of people move out of the city and start traveling a little bit more, well, that frees up a lot of house, that decreases. All of these cities have been popular for so long that means their, their budgets for everything is so high. Uh, and if as soon as the tourist revenue drops, well, they're going to notice that in their budgets right away. So now they're going to be like, wow, we need more guests. How do we get more guests? And they'll, they'll, start, they'll start reversing all these. That's, that's my prediction. I hope it comes true. <laughs> so do you have them sign it physically and send it back to you? No, no, I they come on the site and I tell them this and I didn't want to cancel your reservation and then you have to sign this lease, monthly lease, and then you we can just cancel after four days, you know what I mean? At least if anything okay. comes to knock on the door, hey, you're supposed you're not supposed to do short term, it's not a short term, it's a long term. You know what I mean? Okay. But we still one street up, I think it, it, it turns into being another area which they're allowed to do it, but my area, my street is not allowed. And I just, we've been doing it for three years. It's only because someone found out that we were doing Airbnb and, you know, it just it escalated. And now the inspectors for the parking and like the gates and it's always something. So I'm just trying to figure out how I would do monthly now. And so, but, yeah. you know, I need like a venue to promote our place because like you were saying, our places like we had film, uh, people making films there, TV, TV shows, you know, all kinds of things. But I just need to, I need to focus on the right websites and on maybe Airbnb, God knows, maybe I do like monthly, monthly terms, but I just need to figure out that pricing, you know, cause the pricing and we have six, seven rooms at the house, you know, but I usually rent out rooms separately within the individual room, uh, doors and every, ha everybody has their own fridge and desk and things, but you know, the shared bathroom uh, okay. is there. So that's a big, like are, you still renting, <laughs> are you still renting them out by rooms or are you yeah. renting them out? Yeah, well now I took some listing out because you know, I have a little Airstream, we have a Tiki Hut, you know, we have like, it's like a resort, it's so pretty. But, <laughs> but people would just get, people. I think people just get jealous and they just wanted to, just to make us to stop to it. And yeah. I'm gonna put it's, a stop I, to it, I'm gonna take them to the court, whatever, I don't care, I'm just. But I wish I wish these cities would come up with more more uh, creative ways in dealing with uh, the issues that short term rentals cause rather than trying to restrict. Short yeah, I'm trying to get a bunch of Airbnb hosts against the city of Miami and try to get the permanent short term rental, you know, because the next street turns into another area, which they can. So I'm just trying to, I don't know, I'm just trying to figure it out. Yeah. Oh, well, good luck. Let us know how it goes. Thank you, I will. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Diego says, if I have two houses rented as short terms with mortgages, what is a good structure? Um, that's, well, I don't feel totally comfortable. I'm not an expert on that. Uh, in general, an LLC is probably a good idea. But uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not 100% um, sure on that. If anyone knows, chime, chime in here. I think it would also depend on your specific situation. Do I have strategies uh, to take out the guests for long term if they don't want to leave the Airbnb? That's never been an issue for me. Um, I think probably who, who's asking this, it's never been an issue for you either. Um, I think this is a case of, no, the answer is no, I, I don't have a way to do this. Um, there's usually a, a amount of days. So, 28 days in San Francisco, I think it's 28 days. If you stay for 29 days, well, then you're a, you're considered a long-term guest and the host has to go through some hoops. It depends on how friendly your city is to landlords or to guests, uh, to tenants in this case. Um, San Francisco is very tenant friendly. A great way to 
figure this out is again, based on the host profile, the guest profile, why are they coming to your space? Um, and also you can just, if you're not sure, you could just book them for 28 or 25 days to give you a little buffer just to see. Uh, if, you, if they don't wanna leave, I, I think you have to go through the eviction process depending on, I don't know how they are in, in Miami. Um, it, could be a, it could be a big headache, but I think it's one of those cases where every single time this happens, the media picks it up and, and, and publishes it. And so everyone thinks it's a lot more common than it is. Um, I've hosted maybe a thousand reservations or more. Uh, I've never had anything, never had anything like this. Um, just, just to chime in on that, that, yeah. that happened to us. Oh. And um, um, we had to go through the legal hoops. Um, that was pretty much right before they established uh, tenant rights, you know, after the 28 day period, it's very similar here in Florida. This state is a little more friendlier towards landlords. And um, you may be able to use certain, um, like certain legal, um, like chapters, let's say, in the, in, in the whole, in, in, you know, in the articles and all, all that, and like in the ordinance for Florida. There, there are certain certain phrases, like sentences that you can use to hopefully the, the police can enforce them at the, at the guest's door and have them leave the, the property. Um, if you want, connect with me and um, I can share with you, you know, the, um, the attorney we're using because right now, you know, she's experienced on that, pretty well versed. And um, maybe those can work for you. So give us some more information because even though it's one of those things that's a super unlikely, it's one of those things that you want to avoid at all costs. So how, if you could do it again, what were the, were the red, were the red flags where you were like, Oh yeah, this was, I should have recognized this. Yeah, there were, there were multiple red flags and we also wrote an article about it, but, but just to, um, to add to, for context, um, the the it was a local it was i believe the um the profile was fairly new they didn't have much of identification um in 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 the profile um the the the, the thing that that made her take advantage of the whole situation was also that we did the the extension directly so we accept the payment directly and not and, and you know off of the portal which okay makes you a lot more vulnerable. Um, honestly, she wasn't, she was like, she, she knew what she was doing. She was using the COVID thing, a suspension on evictions to her advantage and just completely abusing us as the hosts because, you know, they suspended the evictions and foreclosures. I think, I believe, I still believe that they are suspended right now. Um, and besides that, um, yeah. Well, the, 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 the card got declined a few days after a week or a few days after she had processed the extension. So, you know, we knew that the card wasn't going to work like a few days, a few, a couple, a, a, about a week or something after that, which made, made our position a lot weaker. And, and she kept saying that we had a rental agreement a month to month. That, that was never true. Like she, she really knew what she was doing, you know? And how did you maintain the communication between this guest? What, what did you try and keep it amicable, or was it was it very much you're going to war and, and uh, because she's in your house after all? Yeah, no, honestly, in the in the beginning, the conversation was really good. It was normal. I I myself went to the property one of one one time at night because um the um the the they were having problems with the smart TV. It wasn't catching cable. So I was showing them how you, how to use the apps. And, you know, I was there helping them out. So during that time, it was fine up until the payment started declining. And we, you know, we asked her, Hey, we need a, a different form of payment. And um, yeah, that's where, that's where a whole came crashing down. And she's, she's out now. Yeah. How many, how, how long was she in there for? Actually, she's still in there. Oh. Mm. This was uh, be ending of March. Ending, beginning, okay. of March, beginning of March. And she's not paying? No. Yeah. 
um, yeah, I think that the only, the, really the only reason, the only way this can happen is if it's a local guest. Um, I have in my house rules uh, that uh, local guests, because uh, I'm on instant book, I say local guests have to reach out before they book. And uh, I think I even say in my New York listing, um, you know, identification is required upon check-in or something like this. But uh, yeah, that situation is very crappy. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, it sucks. But hey, we're, so we're, really, we're, we're much better from it. We learned a lot from it. Yeah, but it all, it all goes back to, as I'm hearing it, it all goes back to um, the, the, the guest profile. It's a new profile. My guess is she didn't go that length in, in that, that, that uh, description a guest uses to describe themselves. I think that is super important. If you have a guest who took the time, proper grammar and punctuation and, and explained a little bit about who they are, those guests are always good if they've, if they've gone the extra route to, add, to do all this extra stuff. Um, if, I were to, if I were to see your profile, I bet there, yeah, I bet you already said it's new. I bet there's not much text there. I bet she did the bare minimums, which kind of it, it very much reflects on the character of the person, the, the, how much time they spent in filling out their guest profile. So let's, let's get back to the chat here. We follow all your work. We have a question. Do you have a strategy for guests if they don't want to leave? Oh, that, that was just asked. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. As a guest, uh, what will motivate you to leave a great review aside from amenities and experience? <clears throat> the ending of the reservation is super important. Um, you could have in the middle of a, the nice thing about a long-term reservation is in the middle of a reservation, you might have a huge, uh, terrible experience with the guest, but you can recover from that. And at the very end of the reservation, that's, um, that's what the guest is mostly going to remember, the end of the reservation. Uh, additionally, in this case, I wouldn't send a reminder email to leave a review. I would just let it flow, but I would let them know, hey, you're going to get a five-star review, and I would extend them this family and friends discount. Um, but that last part is very important. Make their, um, make their checkout as easy as possible. Um, but if you're, yeah, if the reason why that works is if you're in, if you're just a four day reservation and you have a big issue with the guest, well, it's, it's just four days. It just happened. It's fresh in their memory. You're more likely to get a bad experience, but communication is super important too. And this is one of the few reasons why I would recommend hiring a property manager. If you're just not good with customers, if you are not good with community, keeping that communication positive, um, that really affects your, your Airbnb, your reviews, future reservations. And, and the, uh, hi, I am the front desk manager for Stratton Hospitality. And uh, hey, Deb. Um, so my question goes because uh, we're doing uh, big efforts to become super hosts in Airbnb. And as everyone knows right now, um, reviews have a huge part in this process. So we've been, you know, like figuring out how to to make, uh, to motivate our guests to leave a, a great review, not, not only a five-star review, but a text that can communicate to future, future guests or to anyone that goes into, into the listing, um, you know, describe their experience. So that, that is one of my question. For example, I know that the space, the experience, the amenities, um, a few a few weeks ago we did there was a couple that it was an anniversary and we said a, a beautiful gift that was the 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 gift and i wanted to know if you have any other tricks that could motivate long or short-term rental uh short-term uh, guests because for us right now it's very important this is yeah I understand the question. You're, you're asking, there's two types of reviews on Airbnb. Well, there's three types. Negative reviews, which is very uncommon. Most of reviews are just two, three lines saying it's a good experience. And then the really great reviews, which I think affect your search rank, are the really lengthy positive reviews where, where a guest has taken time to go through the review process. 
Part of that has to do with um, the ex experience of the guest. If a guest is very experienced, they're, they're less likely to leave those long reviews just because they have to leave, they leave more reviews and they're very familiar with it. I noticed that more first time guests, early guests and older guests typically leave those longer reviews. But there's no tricks to get a, a, a long review. The trick is it's all the strategies you do as a host. Um, one, one trick you could consider is the experience the guest has in your city affects your review. So if you can affect their experience in your city by giving them you know, the, the secret cafe or the uh, local event, maybe farmer's market every Tuesdays on the side street, uh, if there's free concerts on Sundays, um, this, this lookout, this private trail, if you can increase their experience by giving them these local tips and they really have a great time at your city as well as your listing, um, this is gonna this is gonna motivate them to leave a long review. Um, they don't see your review. Yeah, you could even you could you could um, in the checkout email hint at the fact that really long reviews help your listing. So, um, you know, you'd love it if you can go into detail and describe at least one thing you really liked about the house. That would be great. Uh, but I don't know of any, but you know, every now and then I'll come upon a listing, which seems to have every single review is, is super lengthy. And I've never asked them uh, why. I wonder if they are implementing some strategies. I just optimized a listing like this that I'm going to reach out to them and ask for me, it's maybe one, one every three, I get a longer review. The other two are just positive, uh, but short, not really adding any extra information. Okay, thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, okay, so this, uh, see, oh, it's the same commenter, okay. The, the evicting of the guests. Okay, I'll stay on for, for um, any more questions. Okay, well, thank you, Daniel. Uh, if anybody has any other questions, feel free to jump in. Um, I do. Okay, go, go for it, Ness. Okay, um, when you, you spoke about customer service, obviously that is important in any, any business or any relationship, uh, business relationship. But um, for example, in my case, um, this Airbnb community is mostly virtual. What, what, would you, what do you think about, you know, always giving them a call, uh, maybe in between, or should it be kept through the, 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 the message thread, because I feel that maybe the phone call and, and maybe, you know, calling them and they can hear your voice and your tone and the way you, you speak. And you can also get a lot from the guests, uh, the, the experience if they're more serious or more friendly. Uh, what do you think about, you know, reaching them directly through the phone or just keep it in messages? I would say it depends on the guests. Uh, but you, you mentioned um, customer service as if it has to be face to face. Customer service can be virtual as well. My message that I send 24 hours after check in that just says, "Hey, I hope you checked in okay. If everything is ever, uh, if everything is ever not okay, reach out to me." You can um, glean a lot of information from the guest messages before they check in. If the guest is sending a lot of messages about different questions about the neighborhood or the house, this means that the guest probably needs, needs or wants a little more handholding. In this case, you can offer them a live check-in. Uh, in this case, you can offer them a phone call because there's probably be accepted. On the other hand, if a guest instant books your place and doesn't send a single message, probably they're just there for business. They're not interested in back and forth communication with you. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Great. I think um, um, we have a few questions on the chat. I don't know if you have a time limit, Danny. Um, but we're we're happy you're answering our questions. Yeah, let me let me do these these last two. 
how many times you reach out to your guests throughout the day? Uh, once. Um, but I have a set of messages. There, there are 10 or 11 messages uh, that I send out to every guest. And it's, it's sent out in a way where it really fosters communication and, and opens the communication line and oh, lets them know I'm always available. I do everything via messages and Airbnb, but I make it a point to say, hey, you have two contacts which you can reach at any time via phone. One is an emergency contact, and this is a true emergency. They're, they're available 24 seven. The second one is anything that's not urgent. Um, so you can message your Airbnb or you can call these numbers. Um, and then, like I said, there's these 10 or 11 messages I send out, but I don't reach out to them um, besides these messages. Now, if there is a good thing to do is if there is a local holiday or something coming up during their stay as a guest, it's been super beneficial when the host uh, tells me, when the host just messages me and say, hey, um, this Thursday is uh, the, the Chinese New Year and this is, this is how we celebrate and this is what happens. You know, maybe, maybe they tell you, you know, stores close at 4 p.m. So be sure to do that. Those are super helpful. And the final one is, um, I most definitely prefer a digital guidebook. Um, I definitely don't ignore them. They're super helpful as a guest and as a host. They're, they're helpful in many ways. I prefer digital because you can update it easier and you can send it to the guest. <clears throat> when a guest gets at your space, they're not gonna wanna sit on the couch and flip through your, your guidebook. They're gonna wanna go explore. So if you send them a digital guidebook three or four days before check-in, they can look at this before they arrive. Um, I also send them when they book. I have two guidebooks. One is just a re recommendations and one is all the other things of the house. Right when they book, I send them the recommendations only guidebook because when they book, they're very excited. And this is when they, they might want to look up things to do in the city if they haven't already. And then four days before check-in, I'll send them the, the guidebook, which has the check-in information in the guidebook. That forces the guest to click that link. And when they click that link, they'll understand, oh, this is super helpful. It's well done and it's gonna answer all my questions. So then in the future, they don't have to reach out to me and wait on that lag. It takes me to answer them. They could go to the guidebook first. I always wanna push them to the guidebook because it's, it's, uh, it answers 95% of any kind of question they're going to have with the house. A manual check. You can also do a manual one. Um, I've heard that. Uh, I've heard though, personally, it's never been a complaint of mine. I only do digital guidebooks. If there's older guests who are not technologically savvy, maybe they prefer a, a physical guidebook. Uh, but, but I, I can't confirm that. Also on a digital guidebook, you can send it out. If you have a big house, you can send it out to everyone. Um, as opposed to just one physical one. Yeah, that's, that's I de most definitely, you need a guidebook. Whether you have physical or digital, you need a guidebook. It's crucial to, to your success. Um, and digital guidebook is preferred. Yes. Hostfully does a free, one, one free guidebook. And, and uh, their free version is it's, uh, sufficient. Who was that? Host. What's that? Who does the free guy? Who who provides you with uh, the first uh, free guy? Host hostfully. Hostfully. Oh, interesting. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, unless anyone has special comments or maybe one last question, um, I always say it and I'll say it again. Um, this is a community for hosts by hosts, so it's real helpful to everyone. Um, thank you guys again for 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 reaching out, and uh, let's see. Uh, oh, hopefully, thank you, Daniel. Um, I think uh, let's see. Gene gave us a last question here. Do you prefer physical check-in manuals? Oh, okay. No, you just answered that, right? Yep. Okay. I cool. have a question. Hi, sorry. I have a, I'm starting, well, I just started um, with my Airbnb a couple months ago and we have a keypad for self-check-in and I've noticed that 
sometimes there's guests that bring extra guests or bring guests that were not shared upon, you know, the initial messages. And we're thinking of putting maybe some surveillance cameras outside so that we can be more aware of who's coming in and, and not. But I kind of just want to know more of the, your recommendations, how to handle that. Because to be honest, I'm a little hesitant to go and say like, hey, I think you guys have more than one person there, more than, you know, the people that you say had booked and then get a poor review or have some type of conflict. So I'm noticing that showing up and I don't know what you recommend in regards to that. Yeah, the, the first thing I do to avoid this is I don't charge an extra guest fee. I charge, uh, I charge based on if I have a three bedroom place with six people, I'm gonna charge that, that full occupancy rate because um, no one's booking a three bedroom place with just one or two people. Uh, I see a lot of people who charge, you know, just for two people or three people, and then they add an extra guest charge. Um, all that does, in my opinion, in my experience, is it incentivizes guests to bring, to just say they're having three people and bring extra guests. Mm. Uh, another thing that you should do, everyone should do is go onto your listing. And so if you don't charge for an extra guest, um, and this is a, this strategy should be changed based on what season you're in. If you're in a busy season, then most definitely you can do this. If you're in slow season, okay. then it makes, it may make sense to lower your price and charge for those extra guests. Another thing you should do is go, go into your Airbnb backend. And if your occupancy is six in this example, charge, put in the backend a hundred dollars extra for any guest after six. This gives you some leverage with Airbnb. If the guest brings eight people uh, and you don't have this, well, Airbnb, my, Airbnb will say, okay, they, they do have two extra people, but you don't have an extra guest fee. So they don't really owe any extra money. But if you have a big extra guest fee, then that, that puts them on the hook. If it's a big issue, you can also, this is something to highlight in the guest, the house rules. The house rules, uh, I just, in my house rules, I just provide the most important ones. The things I've had issues with are the things that the guest really needs to obey in the house rules. If a lot of your guests do this, then in the house rules, I'd put it at the first house rule. Any extra guest is charged at $100 via Airbnb. This, um, this will, um, uh, opposite of incentivize, this will not incentivize people to bring extra guests. You could do a camera as well. Um, and then you could add that into the listing if it's a really big issue and just say that, well, you have to, if you, if you record, uh, the, the listing, you can say, you know, we have a ring doorbell with a monitor on the front door, um, just to see when you checked in. Yeah. And that will, that will hint, okay, they're going to check on us. Um, you can also, there's also a, a service called, um, it's not noise aware, it's a different one, Party Squasher. And they, you actually, you don't even have to have this, to be honest. What Party Squasher does is they measure the amount of devices connected to your Wi-Fi. So oh. if you have, um, and each person might have like two devices connected, but if you have like, you know, four or five devices connected per person, then you can kind of assume that they have more people than is allowed. And you can even just send a message and say, Hey, um, I use party squasher. Uh, and I noticed, or, you know, I noticed there's this many people connected to my Wi-Fi. I just want to clarify, you know, there is just uh, six. Do you have just, or how many people do you have? You can specifically ask them. Okay. Very helpful. Thank you. Yes. Just to add in, in terms of cameras, um, that's helped us, uh, you know, see, find guests that uh, check in with dogs when they, when they never disclose that. So, you know, we have fees at some properties for, for you know, about dogs, extra cleaning and stuff. So, you know, that will help us identify that. Well, go ahead, Daniel. Yeah. Oh, you're good. I just took a breathe in and you could tell. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were But you make, you make a really valid point about juggling your five-star review with making an, is an issue and collecting extra money or kicking them out. Um, I always, I maybe too much, but I always prefer taking that five-star review. Um, but for me, again, having extra guests, it's not a common problem. Every now and then it happens and I deal with it at the time. But 
uh, if, if everything is okay, I'm okay with just accepting that little bit of extra wear and tear, a little bit of extra electricity, a little bit of deeper cleaning in favor of that five-star review. It's, it's reservation specific, but um, I always go for the five-star review for sure. Nice. Good to know. Yeah, I'm, I'm with, I, I agree with you because um, favoring the five-star review will, will, will have a, a beneficial impact in the long term, you know, every, with every other guest that looks at your listing and, you know, sees positive reviews. Yeah. So to end, I have a huge um, project coming up that I'm working on now, but I paused it because of coronavirus. I've hired a data scientist and his team to look at Airbnb and reverse engineer what actually goes into ranking. So we're taking a look at a bunch of different uh, items. One of them is um, do number of reviews make a difference or is it just the star rating? Another one, as I mentioned, is it does a longer review actually matter? So we're, we're looking at the correlation. Okay. There's a lot, there's a high percent of, uh, listings with really long, many words per review. So that the, the higher the, the higher the percentage, the more correlated it is to uh, search rank. And that will be coming out um, within the next month or so. If you want to just go to my website and there'll be a little pop up on the bottom that rolls up and you can enter your email in there. That's what will be distributed. Awesome. Awesome. And you, do you want to share a little bit about your, your book? that you published, Daniel? Oh yeah, sure. So the book, uh, it's on Amazon, Optimize Your BNB. The website is Optimize My BNB. So the book is supposed to, it's giving you the, the tools that you need. Um, it's, uh, it's a bestseller on Amazon, the highest reviewed. And the thing I'm most proud about is the most highlighted. On, on Kindle, they show you how many times your, your book has been highlighted. Of all the Airbnb books, mine's the most highlighted, which is uh, the reason why I wrote the book. So uh, I'm happy about that. I just lowered the price. I think it's like 12 bucks for, for the digital version. Um, and if you do get it, or if you've already got it, uh, a review helps me big time. And I think also the longer the review, the better. Uh, that's, the, that's the paid version. Um, and then the blog, uh, so the, the, the blog and the, the YouTube are, um, it's, all, it's all the information. The book is organized in a way that uh, makes a lot of sense. The blog and the YouTube, you have, kind of have to search, and, um, but, yeah, but it is free. Information dissemination is, is my goal. Um, yes, yeah, I forgot to, thanks for reminding me to plug my book. Great. Amazing. Thank you so much, Daniel. If you always, guys want to know more about him or find more, more content, more advice, um, he's everywhere pretty much. Optimize my BNB YouTube channel. You'll find all his playlists and most of his content and his blog and his website as well. So thanks again for joining us, guys. Um, it was a very valuable meeting. I learned a ton. I don't know about you guys, but my notepad is full and uh, we have a lot to talk with our team of so thank you everyone thanks again thank you diego uh have a good night guys thank you daniel thanks for having me awesome thanks bye. daniel bye thank you bye bye thank you thank you